Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University. And in this video, we're going to continue to talk about um, how to calculate the lateral resistance of nailed connections. In the previous video, we looked at all of the kind of geometry aspect, what nailed connections look like when the nail is in the wood, what kind of embedment lengths and wood sizes are required for those connections, and uh, also how to uh, check adequate spacing of the nails in those connections. And in this video, we're going to go through to figure out exactly how to calculate the strength of these connections. And so that strength is built up on the basis of individual nails. So we find the strength of individual nails and then add them all together to get the full strength of a total connection. And how we find the strength of those individual nails is based on a mechanics model that is now, you know, over uh, maybe 70 years old. Um, developed in the, I think, late 40s uh, in Europe, which is a very effective uh, mechanics model for nailed connections and, in fact, all kind of doweled connections like bolts as well. Um, you know, it has been updated over the years, but uh, the basis of that is uh, basically still effective. So uh, that's what we're using. We're going to describe exactly what that looks like. It basically... Um, operates on the basis of uh, checking a whole bunch of different potential failure modes, which uh, which one governs will change on what are the relative strengths and sizes of the pieces of wood in the connection, uh, steel plates, size of steel plates, and uh, the relative strength of the dowel, like the nail or bolt in that connection. Uh, I mean, today we're going to be looking explicitly at what are the um, equations for nailed connections, and later we will uh, when we talk about bolts, we'll update that uh, that discussion in terms of bolts. I mean, they're basically identical, the approaches, but there are some uh, small minor differences between the two. Um, so basically, we're going to build up, um, first of all, what is the lateral resistance for each individual nail. Okay, so before we do that, um, let's just look at the geometry of a nail, and uh, I'm going to draw some pictures. And these types of pictures will repeat over and over in um, our discussion. Okay, so here on the left is a two member connection and on the right, a three member connection. And I'm just going to point out, uh, again, which side is which, uh, how we label each of the members when we talk about them, because uh, it matters when we look at what the uh, different parameters are for each piece of each of these connections. And so um, for the two member connection, we have a head side member, which is the side that the nail head is on. Then we have a point side member. Okay, we have the same for the three member connection, but in this case, both of those members are uh, on the sides so it's the two side members basically are the head side member and the point side member and then the one in the middle the one in the middle is called the central member for the three member connection and you can see that the ways that the uh, loads go so basically we're shearing a connection like this or we have uh, two members clamping another and we're shearing it like this. And so the nail is gonna be sheared across one shear plane for the two member connection on the left and two shear planes for the connection on the right. So there's the one shear plane, two shear planes for that one and one shear plane on the left. Okay, <clears throat> each of these members has a strength. The wood members each have an embedment strength and that is basically the resistance of the piece of wood to the nail pulling through the piece of wood. So if this nail was inside that piece of wood and it is going to be, uh, when we shear the nail, we're going to be trying to pull this, this uh, nail through the wood and we're going to be crushing the wood as it pulls through. And that kind of crushing strength, it's like a bearing strength. If we talk about steel, we talk about it in terms of bearing strength that uh, bearing strength is basically called our uh, embedment strength. And each piece of wood will have one. And the pieces of wood, of course, in these connections, they can be different sizes. They can be different um, species even. Um, sometimes they can be steel. Some of them can be steel. So they will have different embedment strengths depending on what material they are. <clears throat> 
Okay, and there are three different embedment strengths that we'll use. Um, we have F1 and F2, which are basically just the straight embedment strengths of a nail being pulled through a piece of wood, you know, like this straight. And then we also have this embedment strength F3, which is for cases where the nail is yielding as it's being pulled through an embedment. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little more um, in a little bit. So those are the general, uh, you know, generally how the connection looks and how the strengths lay out. And then um, now we're going to go through each of the modes in um, the uh, mechanics-based equation and talk about it. So uh, all of these different uh, equations for strength NU, that's a lateral, in, uh, a lateral nail strength per nail, so for just one nail, that's what the small NU is, um, are based on this uh, so-called Johansson yield model, which is named for the person who developed it uh, in the mid-20th century. And uh, this is also called the European yield model, basically... Um, most of wood standards around the world uh, have adopted this yield model for um, determining strength of nail joints. Okay, so we're going to go through each one by one. This is the first one, A. So this is the first potential failure mode. And this failure mode is an embedment failure in one of the members. And I'm going to show here um, basically where the failure happens. So basically what's happening here is the nail is pulling through uh, the top side member, basically the head, the head side member for the two member connection. And it's pulling through both the head side and point side member in the three member connection. So this purple bit that I'm drawing here is basically where the wood has been damaged by nail pull through, the nail is in black. And um, yeah, so this is an embedment failure. Okay, you so you could also call that the bearing failure. So this is basically the mode where the side member is basically the weakest link in the chain, right? So the load path goes from the side member through the nail and then into the point side member or in the three member connection, it goes from the side members, the two side members through the nail into the central member and then out. So since all of those are in a series, um, typically one of them is going to be the weakest link and fail. So in this case, you know, if the side member happens to be the weakest part, then that's the part of the connection that is going to fail first. And that's going to define the strength of that connection. So if we look at the equation for that NU is F1, which is the embedment strength of that member, the side member, like the head side member, the weak member there. And DF is the diameter of the fastener, as we recall. And T is the thickness of that side member. Then um, you can see here that we have basically a strength F1 times DF T1, which is basically a bearing area. So this totally makes sense. This is the bearing area of the side plate. So a strength times an area, um, you know, very clearly gives us a uh, force resistance for this uh, connection failing under this failure mode. Let's move on to the next one, B. Okay, so in failure mode B, it's very similar to failure mode 1, except this time it happens to be the other member that is the weak one. Oh, I don't have three member for this one. Sorry. So this is the two member case for this, where I only have um, the basically point side member now failing. So if the point side member is weaker than the head side member in this case, uh, in terms of embedment strength, then that's the one that's going to fail. So obviously you can see where this is going. I'm going to check A. I'm going to see what the resistance force is. I'm going to check B, see what the resistance force is. If B was less than A, then obviously B is my governing force. And I'm going to do that for all seven uh, different modes. Well, in fact, I, I'm going to check a subset of those modes, depending on uh, whether I have a two-member connection or a three-member connection. <clears throat> 
Okay, and so again, we have a very similar equation where df times t2 is the um, bearing area in the point side member times f2, which is the strength, you know, in terms of stress of that point side member. So if I was going to um, characterize this failure mode, I would call that a weak point side member failure mode. Now on to C. So failure mode C here is very similar to failure mode B. It's again the not side member that is failing. So we're pulling through now the central member. Um, so that's another embedment failure for the central member. This one is only for three member connections. Um, again, DF times T2 is a bearing area. This time for the central member. And then why do we have this um, factor of one half? That's because the way that these equations work, um, they're based on um, a nail strength per nail, but also per shear plane, because later in the overall equation for calculating the connection strength, we're going to multiply by the number of shear planes. So in the top one here, B, there's only one shear plane. So when I find that strength, uh, NU for mode B, um, I'm just basically calculating the bearing area times the strength for that one member and multiplying it by one because there's one shear plane. Now for C, I'm going to find the bearing area for that one member, okay, but then uh, later I'm going to have to multiply that value by two because there's two shear planes here. So in order to counteract that, since I only have one member, even though I have two shear planes, um, I need to uh, basically divide by two preemptively. So I divide by two here, I multiply by two later. Overall, I'm going to get F2 one times F2 DF times T2, which is basically exactly the shear strength of um, this middle, um, middle member here, the central member. When we were looking at A, you see here it totally makes sense because we're doing F1 times DF times T1. So for the two-sided, for the two-member connection on the left, it makes sense because it's just one shear plane times uh, that strength, and that strength is for one member. And on the right, I have basically the same. The strength on the left is for one member, and later I'm going to multiply it by two shear planes, and that's how I'm going to get the uh, strength for both members on the right because you can see that for the three-member connection, both of those members have to fail simultaneously to fail the member in this uh, side member failure mode. Okay, so that is C. Let us move on to the next one, which is D. Okay, so failure mode D is the first one where we see um, nail yielding. So the previous ones, it was all failure in the wood. Here we have kind of a combined failure in the wood and the nail. So here the nail is yielding inside the side plate here. So basically, we, in order for this failure mode to occur, we have to uh, fail both the nail and we have to fail the side member. So the side member is also getting damaged um, by embedment. So basically, in order for the nail to bend like this, the side member has to um, also crush something like this. So we're pulling the nail through the side member as it bends. So basically, those uh, purple areas get um, damaged in that process as the nail has to turn. Okay, so it's a weak nail and side member combo. So that's kind of uh, the, um, here the main member is uh, the strongest piece. Okay, so how do we break down kind of this equation here? We have a couple terms. Um, this one here is the one that's associated with the nail yielding. If we take this second term and we multiply it by the number out here on the outside of the uh, parentheses, 
and we simplify, then what we get basically is F1 T1 times DF, which we'll recognize as the regular embedment strength um, divided by five. So basically this is um, an embedment failure of the wood, but modified to account for the fact that it's not being pulled directly through the wood, it's kind of damaging the wood on an angle. So the embedment strength for that is, um, is lower. Okay, so the other interesting thing here is that we don't actually see F2 come into the equation. We only see this parameter um, F3. And F3, as I mentioned briefly before, is uh, not the regular embedment strength. It's the embedment strength um, in a member where the, where the nail is actually uh, bending and yielding. So why do we use that F3 instead of F2? Okay, so basically what's happening here is we are counting, accounting for this uh, so-called string effect, rope effect. It's called different things depending on, uh, you know, where you read it. You find this in the European standards as well. They account for it slightly differently. In the Canadian standard here, we account for it by basically increasing the embedment strength um, to F3. So F3 is greater than F2 to account for this effect. Okay, so basically what's happening here is um, let's say that this is my nail. So this is not a wood fiber now, this straw, this straw is a nail. When the nail uh, bends, so let's say that this part is embedded in the piece of wood and this part is embedded in another piece of wood. And as the straw bends and I am pulling on it downwards, right? So I'm, I'm shearing this basically. And as I shear at the interface, I get a bend. So this is yielding here. And that is obviously pulling, it needs to pull through this piece of wood in order to um, bend like that. So that was the second term that we were talking about. Okay, but what about the first term, which is accounting for this yielding? Basically what's happening is that as I bend this down and I'm pulling it down, you'll notice that I'm not only bending the nail, I'm also, as I pull this down, I'm pulling the nail, right? So there's some component of this shear force that's causing bending, but the larger that the angle becomes, I am also getting pulling. So I am loading the nail in two different ways. And so as my angle becomes big, and for these nail connections, we can get big angles like this, then I have some direction that's actually engaging the nail in tension. And so since some of the force is going into tension instead of into bending, that means that I'm getting extra strength out of this connection. So that's why we increase the strength F3 um, over F2. So it's kind of a geometric effect. It's like a, a large displacement effect actually in some sense. Um, so anywhere that we see basically um, um, bending like this through the piece of wood, then we will see this parameter um, F3. Whenever the, the nail is bending significantly, we'll see this parameter F3 used instead of F2. Okay, so that is um, D, and that's the first time we see F3, so I'm not going to describe it again um, on the next one. So let's look at the next one, which is E. So now we're on to number five. Okay, so this is a similar one to D. So in D, we had the, um, in the two member connection, we had the nail um, pulling through and yielding in the um, head side member. Here in E, it's the same except for the point side member. So we have this, we have to pull through here and at the same time have yielding. So of course, as we expect, this equation is very similar. There's only um, a slight difference which is that here we are now using T2 instead of T1. And recall that T2 is not necessarily the thickness of our point side member. It is basically the penetration distance of the nail into that member. In all of these, I've drawn this nail as basically coming all the way through the member. Okay, but recall that in most cases, 
uh, when our nail gets embedded in the second member, um, it's not going to go all the way through. There's going to be some, um, some distance that it doesn't penetrate, probably. And so it's the actual penetration length that we use for the value of T2 in, in all of these equations. Okay, so in failure mode F, <clears throat> what we have is if we have a very strong nail and the nail will not bend and yield, um, then instead of having a case where we um, have embedment failure through the member, like through this, like this, um, if both of these members are very similar, then what could happen is basically I um, have the nail rotate through both of these. Um, so if I had another one, <clears throat> I had another one and my nail is going through both of these basically my nail just uh, rotates as one turns relative to the other so as this moves the nail just rotates so it has to damage this one on an angle has to damage this one on an angle as well and so I get embedment failure in both like this but it is the lower embedment strength because um, remember it's the one where I basically have uh, embedment strength failure on an angle. I have a much lower strength. That's where that factor of one fifth comes in. Okay, so you know this equation looks kind of complicated for what it is, but the reason it's like this is because basically all the equations have this F1 DF squared at the beginning and uh, they're all kind of factorized like that for consistency. But if we expand this equation, we get F1 df t1 over 5 and F2 df t2 over 5, which is just the embedment strength for the point side member plus the embedment, sorry, the embedment strength of the head side member plus the embedment strength for the point side member, which is exactly the same as um, what we had over here when we had the embedment strength of the side members um, with yielding the second term over here. Okay, so it's just that, but now for both members simultaneously. And so it totally makes sense. And there is just one more um, failure mode left. Okay, so this is the case where the nail is very weak relative to the other members. So basically the nail fails kind of locally, just in one spot as the um, as one wood member moves past another, we basically get a yielding of the nail like this, which requires a little bit of um, damage to the uh, members, but not too much. So we have maybe some small localized damage here and here, 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 here and here as that member yields, as that uh, nail yields. But you can see from the equation that uh, this equation basically um, is similar to the first terms in these equations where we had nail yielding before, like this term right here. But, you know, modified for more, um, more bending because these nails are now bending uh, twice. So they have double, um, uh, uh, double curvature basically at those points. Um, yeah, oh, the other thing that I forgot to mention in these equations is Fy. Uh, Fy is the yield strength of the um, nail. Okay, so now that we have all of those equations, there's seven of them. Um, so we saw that some of them uh, are applicable to both two member connections and three member connections. Some of them are only for two member connections. So if I have a two member connection, I'm going to use A, B, I'm going to skip C, I'm going to use D, I'm going to use E and F and G. But for three member connections, I actually have uh, fewer to do. So for three member connections, I will only calculate A, I'm going to skip B, I'm going to calculate C, a D, and then I'm going to skip these two, E and F, then I'm going to calculate G. So I only actually have, I think, four to calculate for three member connections, four different failure modes.
Okay, so now we have to know how to calculate basically these um, embedment strengths. So we're gonna go through each of these terms and I'm gonna uh, describe the equations basically that we use to calculate them. Okay, so for wood members, you know, most of the members that we use, um, we have these equations uh, for F1, F2, which is basically regular embedment strength, and F3, which is the embedment strength for a yielding nail pulling through a member. Uh, remember, the F3 is greater, as we can see here, F3 is greater. It's more than twice as big as F1, F2 for account, to account for that string rope effect that we were talking about. You can also see that the embedment strength is um, proportional to, uh, uh, inversely proportional actually to the size of the fastener. So the larger the fastener, the lower the embedment strength <coughs> that we have. And then we have this term Jx. So G, which is what most of the strength is based on, is basically a density for the wood. And uh, you know, as we talked about way back when we were talking about wood mechanics, um, strength of wood is uh, proportional to density. So denser pieces of wood have higher strength. <clears throat> okay, so Jx is um, a factor to account for reduced strength of connections in CLT. So we're not covering CLT uh, in this course. So uh, generally, so Jx is gonna be 1.0. Um, all the CLT stuff is very similar to the other ones, so you can look those up um, yourself. And G is a mean relative density, which I get from a table um, in the um, appendix. And I've given the table values there, and this is what that table looks like. So, for example, if I am talking about a spruce pine fir um, piece of lumber, timber, then I read across... Um, and you can see that I get um, mean oven dry relative density of 0 0.42. And we talked about relative densities, uh, I think, quite a ways back. Okay, so that's the number 0 0.42 that you would use in that equation if I'm talking about a, um, a spruce pine glue lamb. Okay, that's over here. And if I read across, I get a mean oven dry relative density of 0 0.44. So these are the G values that I use in that equation. And you can see it's species uh, dependent. And you can see CLT values are um, included in here as well. Okay, so that's how I calculate my embedment strength for wood members. Um, what about for um, other wood elements that you might see in connections like this, um, like OSB and plywood? Okay, so for structural panels, we get this value for F, which is 104 times G, also dependent on the DF. Now this one is 0.1 instead of 0 0.01. That's not a typo. Um, these are uh, different for uh, different reliance on the diameter of the fastener here. Um, uh, and then uh, G, we don't get from the table. We just have values here for the different kinds of plywood directly in this clause. Okay, so now um, just another point, when it says here F1 equals F2, that just means, um, you know, it could be, this could be for F1 or it could be for F2. So it depends on what your member is. That doesn't mean that always F1 equals F2. It just means that, you know, if my F1, uh, if, if I have a Douglas fir plywood on this side, uh, on the top side, maybe that one's F1 in this case. Or, you know, in a different case, I might have Douglas fir plywood for the uh, point side, which then would it, I would use it for F2. So I'm going to use for F1 whatever, um, whatever member F1 is, and I'm going to use for F2 whatever member F2 is. So it, um, it doesn't mean that those two are the same. It just means that I apply it the same to F1 or F2. Um, so if I have a wood member for F1, I'm going to use F1 from up here. And if I have a structural panel for F2, I'm gonna use the F2 from here. Okay, I hope that that is um, clear. Okay, a few other embedment strengths that we need. Uh, if we have a steel side plate, you know what? I'm gonna change these to say F1 or F2. So that's clearer. F1 or F2 equals that. <clears throat> 
F1 equals F2 is the way they show it now in the um, 086.19. I'm going to say F1 or. I think this will be clearer. Okay, so for steel, Okay, so for steel, I have this parameter KSP equals uh, phi steel over phi wood times FU. Um, you'll probably recognize um, mild steel versus cold form steel. So mild steel is like regular steel plates, um, like, you know, three, 300W, 350W kind of grades. Um, and... and um, Cold form light gauge steel is like, um, you know, like the kind of steel that they use in uh, sheet metal for uh, steel studs and stuff like that. But remember, we have a minimum thickness requirement for side plates for steel. So we can't use super thin, like I can't use just super thin um, sheet steel. It has to be that minimum thickness. Phi of wood is given. That's the same phi that we use for our connection calculations. And Fu is our minimum tensile strength. That's ultimate um, like overall tensile strength, not the yield strength. And in the standard, they they uh, list out for your convenience um, what some of those strengths are for different grades of steel that you might use. And then last but not least, for the nail, it's worth uh, noting that all of these uh, values give, um, all of these equations give values in MPA. So for the nail, the uh, yield stress uh, depends only on the diameter. So a larger diameter nail is going to have a smaller yield. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it. So we get that value in MPA. Okay, so I think I'm going to put a cut here. Um, we have looked at basically the individual nail strength in this video. So we looked at all the Johansson yield equations, um, all of the different modes that we need to consider and uh, what are all the inputs for those. And then in the next video, which is going to finish up this topic of uh, lateral strength of nailed connections, we are going to um, calculate the total resistance of the nailed connection. So we're going to add up all the nails uh, properly, we're going to include modification factors and uh, a bunch of other um, potential modification factors.